Good time zone, everyone. I'm Hog, this is The Dice, and this time we're going to talk about the sea and water. The subject of this Irish folklore video was chosen by my patrons on Patreon. You can help vote to decide what kind of content I make by signing up for as little as $1 a month. Water, and especially the sea, has a very dualistic kind of role in Irish folklore. It was both seen as a source of great plenty, great bounty, one of the primary food sources, one of the primary sources of vital resources in general, but it was also seen as a source of great danger, of great threat to both life and limb. And through both of those associations together, the sea and water in general could be seen as very mysterious, very unknown. Now you can see all of those things come forward in folklore surrounding the sea and water, but also in folklore regarding creatures and figures that lived within the sea and within the water. All of these figures and creatures would have tended to have both very strong positive associations a very strong negative associations. But you'll find it's often the case that very little is known about them, about where they come from, what their motivations are, and what kind of communities they live in. Now, keeping this duality and this sense of mystery in mind is very important when discussing the relationship between the Irish people and the sea, and water in general. Part 1. Fishing and Food For a large part of Ireland's pre-colonial history, most of the population lived either along the coast or along the banks of rivers. Um, most of the midlands were heavily forested. As a result of this, Ireland had a very strong seafood culture, that didn't really start going into decline until around about the 18th and 19th centuries when restrictions on fishing and foraging began being imposed. Seaweed was often harvested in coastal areas and this was seen as kind of a community event. People would go out uh, in droves as a community and they would all work together harvesting the seaweed. A seaweed had an awful lot of uses. Of course you could eat it, there were varying kinds that people would eat, but it was also used as a fertilizer, it was used as animal feed, um, it was used for treating various different kinds of illnesses. Even today, when I have like a sore throat or a cough or something like that, or a chest infection, I will make a tea out of a kind of seaweed called carrageen moss which is a bit like drinking hot snot, but it, it does work quite well. Um, and seaweed could even be used for making soap and iodine. And the thing is that the gathering of seaweed could was usually done on land that was considered to be commonly owned, owned in common. Uh, didn't really require any specialized tools to do. You could get specialized tools for it, of course, but you didn't necessarily need them. So it was a good way uh, for making a little bit of extra money or even just providing for yourself directly without any major financial investment involved. So it was a good way for even the very poorest people in Ireland to help provide for themselves or feed themselves. There's even a song about this. <laughs> Similarly, shellfish such as crabs, scallops, oysters, mussels and, to a lesser extent, lobsters didn't necessarily require specialized equipment to gather. 
and could usually be gathered on land that was held in common. And so, because they weren't difficult or expensive to procure, they made up a significant part of people's diets. And, and while they weren't quite as multi-purpose as seaweed, they were still good for providing for yourself and even just for selling later. However, the larger part of people's diets would have been made up of fish. So fishing would have been one of the most common uh, occupations in terms of uh, providing food. And most of that fishing would have been done out on boats. It wouldn't have been done from the shore. It would have been at sea, on the body of a river, on the body of a lake. Uh, this was a very, very dangerous job, fishing and sailing in general, especially on the west coast of Ireland, which faces out into the Atlantic Ocean. And so there are many stories and songs in the Ducas archive that talk about drownings and shipwrecks, and many of them are accounts of genuine historical events. <laughs> Because fishing and sailing in general were such dangerous occupations, there was a great many superstitions surrounding them. It was considered bad luck to go fishing on St. John's Day. It was believed that it was bad luck to be near the water on the seventh Sunday after Easter, which is the festival of Whitson, as those who had drowned were believed to come back on that day to drag the living down with them. It was considered bad luck to start a voyage after meeting a foxy woman, which I assume means red-haired. Um, very interesting seeing the term foxy goes back to the 1930s at least. That's, that's, that tickled me a little bit. Um, now if you did meet a foxy woman on the day that you were intending to sail, you were supposed to delay the voyage by a couple of days just to avoid incurring that bad luck and while you were actually sailing it was considered bad luck to talk about foxes, hares or rabbits as they were unlucky animals. You weren't supposed to whistle as that might summon uh, uh, an unwelcome amount of wind. Uh, it was bad luck to interfere with cormorants because cormorants would often warn when a gale was approaching. And also, just don't be a fucking prick. Cormorants, they're lovely birds. Leave them alone, be sound. Now, tied to these superstitions, it has become a folk belief that the cabling on Aaron jumpers was um, something that was passed down through certain families for generations. And it was done intentionally so that if one of the fishermen drowned and their body washed up on shore, you could tell who they were because of the cabling pattern. It would be their family's pattern. Now, this idea is not based in historical fact. Uh, Aaron jumpers didn't actually become a thing in Ireland until the 60s. It definitely isn't generations and generations old. They weren't passed down through family lines. Uh, this is still folklore, as it is a folk belief. It is not based on historical fact and is not an actual folk practice, but it is folklore. Uh, for more on the actual origin of the Aaron Jumper and where the idea of that cabling came from, I suggest looking at this video I don't know which hand I should be pointing with, so I'm pointing with both. It's in the cards uh, by the crafty Kylock who did a deep dive on the entire subject. Editing hog here. Um, just wanted to say that 
YouTube doesn't let you put as many links into the cards as I need to for this, for all the references I want to make. So I've made a playlist instead. All the videos I mention being linked in the cards, they're in the playlist. Now uh, back to our scheduled programming. Uh, a similar idea, or was very similar idea, has been put forward about the Chris, which is kind of woven belt that was common in Ireland for a long time and ended up being pushed to the west coast, uh, kind of localized to the west coast because you know Oliver Cromwell and all that. But anyway, um. Yeah, a similar idea that the, the woven patterns, the colours used, would be would have been passed down through family lines, so drowned fishermen could be recognised. Uh, the thing is, it's I'm finding it hard to trace where this idea actually came from. I can't find an ultimate source for it. And even searching on Dukas for the Chris, uh, I'm finding pictures of people... Well, a picture which is on screen now of someone weaving one, but no real mention of the belt itself. There's a couple of mentions of woven belts, but no real detailed accounts on them, which I think is probably because, because the fact that we can see a Chris being woven in one of the pictures on the archive shows that they were definitely a thing and they're not a comparatively recent invention like the Iron Jumper, but... I think that they were considered just such a mundane item that people just didn't think it was really necessary to talk about them that much. Which leads me to believe that this idea of the Chris Bells being a method of distinguishing drowned fishermen wasn't an actual folk practice. It's a later folk belief that got put onto this uh, uniquely Irish form of clothing, which not massively uniquely Irish, but you know what I mean. However, despite the fact that the idea of the cabling of the iron jumpers was definitely not a real folk, folk practice, and the, the weaving of the Chris belts for the same reason was probably not a real folk practice, the fact that these ideas were so readily accepted is probably the result of just how many superstitions and beliefs there are around the dangers of the sea, the dangers of sailing and fishing. That there were so many superstitions already allowed these ideas to kind of slot very neatly into the established folk beliefs. Those folk beliefs that did exist made these ones feel plausible, if you know what I mean. Now, speaking of the dangers of fishing and sailing, the two greatest of these dangers would, of course, have been... The weather and the sea. Been. It's impossible, really, to talk about the weather and the sea, or water in general, as separate things, because meteorologically speaking, they influence each other so much. And that's, that's actually kind of obvious. People have always sort of known that the weather and the sea are tied to each other. Uh, a lot of the predictions about the weather involve the sea, and a lot of the predictions involving the sea involve the weather. It's kind of symbiotic. So it's kind of impossible to talk about the weather and water as separate things because of how much, even just meteorologically speaking, they influence one another. And there's kind of always been an understanding of that connection. People have always known that uh, the behaviour of the weather is tied to the sea and vice versa. Uh, there are two main ways of predicting the weather in Irish folklore. Uh, they would be by reading the behaviour of animals or by looking at the landscape. Uh, both would have been fairly accurate, but in kind of different ways. Uh, predicting the weather using the, the behaviour of animals would have been things like seabirds fly inland when a storm is coming, cows tend to gather together in a field when it's going to rain, 
that kind of thing. And that tends to be fairly universal. It doesn't matter what part of the country you're in, you see those behaviours, you have a reasonable idea of what the weather is going to be like. Whereas with the landscape, that tended to be very, very regional. Uh, the geographical features on the landscape also have a large influence on the weather. Uh, like what side of the mountain you're, uh, what side of a mountain you're on, what side of a lake you're on, that kind of thing, how close you are to the coast. These things all change how the weather is going to behave. And so it was possible through passing down observations made over several generations to predict the weather based on the behavior of the landscape, but only within a highly localized area and those observations that had been passed down wouldn't be that useful just about like 10 miles away for example. A weather wasn't just thought of as a purely natural danger though or as something uh, devoid of a consciousness behind it. Uh, there were some beliefs that a Kylock could control the weather and this would usually be done through stirring up a big tub of water. Now, sometimes there would be some talisman involved or some words would be spoken, but the tub of water and stirring it up was very consistent. That was the, the main modus operandi. And um, the stories vary on whether or not the Kylock needed to keep stirring it or if once it had reached a certain point, it would keep going. Uh, some stories even describe, like, actual waves and little storm clouds gathering over the tub. Tiny little ones. And the Kylock would do this to create a storm out at sea. Uh, a region of the sea, usually one occupied by a sailor or fisherman that the Kylock had issues with, um, would mimic the conditions of the water in the bucket or in the tub. And that would be a Kylock's way of getting revenge on someone or just showing that she didn't like someone or just getting rid of someone inconvenient to her. Now, there were other creatures that were thought to have some measure of control over the weather. Mananen MacLear and Down were both said to have some measure of control over the weather. As I've said before in the Down video, when storm clouds gathered around Knockfear Nihil, that was supposed to be Down gathering his riders. That was something Down was intentionally doing. And Merrow and the fairies could be connected to the weather as well, quite loosely. Mero in particular, it's difficult to say whether it was connected to them because the stories involved, they are definitely people who live beneath the water that are connected to the weather in those stories, but whether or not they could be classified as Mero is a little bit sketchy. Another interesting thing that I stumbled upon reading about this is the use of the worm knot in altering the weather, whether by dissipating storms or uh, guaranteeing good weather. Uh, the worm knot is when you tie three knots into a string or a piece of rag, and it's more commonly associated with cures. Uh, it cures in both animals and in humans, and especially cures for intestinal ailments. So it's interesting to see this thing that is usually associated with health and disease being applied to the weather, though it's only in a handful of entries that this has been seen, or at least seen by me. People who have actually lived in Ireland will understand this and everyone else might not, but because our weather is so drastically changeable, we can have all four seasons in the space of a couple of seconds. It's not difficult to see why people would believe that there could be supernatural forces influencing the weather, as that would explain that incredibly sudden changeability that we see. Because the figures and the creatures we see 
influencing the weather tend to be very fickle. Uh, Manon and McLear down, they're both associated with being very kind of mercurial, very kind of... Um, they could be very nice at one moment and very, very not nice the next. Uh, the same could be said for uh, fairies or for Mero just in general, that they can be very changeable. That would be part of their personality. And so the idea that these very changeable figures, very changeable creatures, would be connected to control over such a changeable aspect of the environment makes perfect sense. And that context of the incredibly changeable weather also helps to explain why there were so many superstitions around what could change that weather, what could trigger those changes about little things that you might do that could trigger those sudden changes in weather. Part 3. Ghost Ships Right, so objectively, this section should have actually been much shorter, and it should be in the previous section, and it shouldn't, should only really be about a paragraph long. But, but, it's the only part of this entire thing that I wasn't f really familiar with before I started researching this video, and I think it's cool. I think it's very cool, and it has piqued my interest, so fuck you, fuck objectivity, I'm doing whatever the fuck I want. Ghost boats and ghost ships. Now, the reason I like this is because there's actually, while there are plenty of stories, there are plenty of references to it, there's very little certainty around it. Uh, it was regarded as something extremely mysterious, as something without any known source, and that kind of thing always fascinates me. Uh, as well as that, because folklore is so multifaceted, because it is so um, changeable, uh, regional variants of folk beliefs, of folk stories, they're extremely common. You will have a hundred different versions of the same story with different characteristics. You'll have hundreds of different versions of the same creature with different characteristics spread throughout a culture. That's fascinating to me. I love that. And here, because of its sense of mystery, um, you can kind of intuit the variety that could have been behind it. Uh, let me explain. So, with the ghost boats, and for clarity's sake, I'm defining the ghost boats as small vessels that could have been crewed by, like, one person to, like, five people, and the ghost ships as much, much bigger. Uh, the ghost boats, they seemed contemporary. Uh, they seemed to be the kind of little small fishing vessels that were in use at the time of recording. And what would happen in those stories is that there would be a group of people out on their boats fishing on a lake or fishing on the sea and suddenly, out of nowhere, this mysterious boat that looks pretty much like the others but no one recognises it, no one knows who it belongs to, comes tearing through the group, tearing right through the middle of the group, out the other side and just sails off into the distance. Sometimes there is no crew, sometimes the crew don't respond to what people are saying to them. After this apparition has passed through the group of uh, fishing boats, everyone is immediately, we need to go back to shore, we need to go back to shore, and then they do, and then there's a massive storm, and anyone who didn't go back to shore drowns. Um... <laughs> And what I love about it is that this could be a friendly warning. Like, lads, there's going to be a storm. Get back to shore. Get back to shore now. Given by the, the, the crew of the boat, whether visible or invisible. It could be an unfriendly warning. Uh, get off my lawn or there will be consequences. Again, given by the crew of the boat. And... or. It, and both of those things have different explanations depending on 
what kind of person you think the crew of the boat are. Because if it's a friendly warning and they're ghosts, then they could be people who have drowned on that lake or drowned in that part of the sea before and are trying to save others from a similar fate. But if they're fairies, that could that is more likely to be the unfriendly warning. That was more likely to be the this is my space and you're not allowed here kind of warning. But there's other ways of looking at it too. Because uh, sometimes this happens at only specific times of year. There's one story where it happens on St. Martin's Day where you're not supposed to fish. And then in that case, it could be a warning from St. Martin. It could have been St. Martin in that boat. Um, and I just find that potential for variety incredibly interesting, incredibly fascinating. I only saw one entry that actually speculated on the identity of the boat and where the boat came from. And that was the informant telling the collector, I'm certain that was a fairy boat. But there's like no basis given for that other than it was a mysterious boat that mysteriously vanished. Um, <laughs> it's just really, really interesting and really fun to engage with. And this is part of why I love folklore so much. Now, as for the ghost ships, their stories are really interesting too. The ghost boats, they seem to have been things that could have been around for a long time, that could have been circulating for a, a great period of time in the oral tradition. Just because they're... It's a fairly basic story structure. The, the details given about the boat are very basic. There's... there's um, nothing to really tie them to a certain time period. However, the stories about the ghost ships, they're also interesting, but they have details that describe a time period. Like there are two varieties of the ghost ship. And one variety is when they are described as an old fashioned ship with sails. And another version where they are described as having their engines running. So it would seem that having their engines running would have been the contemporary ship of the time, the, the ships with engines. But what happens in these stories is that the ship will show up and just loom ominously on the water and then there will be a terrible disaster. Not even necessarily a disaster at sea, it might be a building on the docks burning down or something like that, but there will be a disaster. In one case, and this is my favourite, it's in one of the ones where the, the ship had engines that, were, that could be heard, that were running. The captain and one of the crew members of the ship get into a lifeboat, come to another ship, and warn them directly with their words that there is a disaster coming and that they should leave. And the people on the ship that's been warned do not leave. And so when their ship goes down and is sinking, the, the ghost ship turns up again and the captain shouts down, Didn't I warn you? Sure I told you, didn't I? And I fucking love that. The sheer vindictiveness of that. That's so wonderfully petty. It's just beautiful. Part 4. The Otherworld and Otherworld Creatures. I'm not going to talk too much about water-dwelling otherworld creatures in this video, as I've already done videos on the Doverku, on Merrow, and on lake monsters in general. Links to all of those in the cards or in the description. And as for otherworld voyages, I've already done the Voyage of St. Brendan, also linked for that video, in the cards or in the description, or possibly both. Now, the rest of this video so far has really just been building up the proper context needed to understand this part of the video. We've already established how the sea and water were seen as sources of great plenty. Uh, they were the main source of food. They were the main source of economic empowerment for the poor, for the disenfranchised. Uh, how they were seen as a great source of self-sufficiency for those who 
couldn't afford to run a farm or to partake in any other kind of form of business. And we've also seen how the sea and water were seen as places of great danger, how common it was for people to drown, how common it was for fishermen and sailors to be in danger through their work and how many superstitions had built up around that idea. And through the combination of those things, we also see both the sea and water become locations of great mystery. Because of that combination of danger and plenty, the worst fate you could imagine, the, the worst kinds of deaths you could think of would take place at sea, but also the sea would be the source of the greatest possible rewards. Uh, like in the other world voyages, we see you can literally sail to heaven. You can sail to, to islands of eternal wealth, of islands of eternal youth. Major, important, magical things that are massively sought after. These huge... Immense rewards could be found at sea as well as the great dangers of sea monsters and storms and patches of sea where there is no wind and there is no way to move forward without destroying yourself through weeks of rowing, that kind of thing. This duality of the, the danger and the reward as well as the mystery can also be seen in some of the stories of the other world creatures. In stories with marrow, for example, you have the reward. The marrow usually makes the, the man she marries very prosperous, usually brings him great success and, of course, children. But then when he betrays her, when, uh, when he violates her conditions or she finds her Kathleen Drake, if she's been kidnapped, suddenly all of that goes away. Suddenly the marrow becomes a source of danger, cursing the family perhaps, or killing the children, something like that. And then in the case of lake monsters, lake monsters are often guarding a treasure. They are guarding a, a sunken treasure or an island with hidden gold or something like that. They are the danger that is actively denying you the reward, that is denying you the source of plenty, the source of bounty, that has to be defeated. And the mystery lies in how it can be defeated. Just like with the marrow, the mystery lies in where do they come from? What are they? How do you keep them happy? Uh, what is the nature of these conditions? Why do these conditions exist? It can even be seen in the water horse stories. At first, the water horse is a fantastic worker. It is bringing, bringing great benefit to the farm and the farmer, doing the work far faster than other horses. It becomes the farmer's favorite horse as a result. But then again, once you betray it, once you... Uh, strike it, it drowns you. It drowns the farmer. And in some of the stories, once the horse is under the water with the farmer, it changes shape, becoming more monstrous, becoming more uh, otherworldly. And in that we see the bounty of the water, the danger of the water, and the mystery of the water all at once. And that's what we're dealing with when we connect the water with the other world. And if you want any more detail on any of those, I suggest looking at my Marrow Reloaded video and my Lake Monsters video. Uh, when most people think of the other world, they tend to think of the fairy hills, of the mounds where the fairies would cross over between our world and the other world. They don't usually think of the water. And even though we have examples like The Voyage of St. Brendan, that particular story is so much more heavily Christianized than others that it is especially hard to pull apart the Christian and pre-Christian elements of that. 
However, there are still other stories that we can compare it to that are less heavily Christianized, such as the Voyage of Bran and the Voyage of Maeldun. All three stories involve the voyagers setting off for a kind of promised land and having to endure terrible dangers like sea monsters, the, the, the giant fish Jason in the Voyage of St. Brendan, or traps, uh, islands that are very much traps that are, are dangers in themselves, like the Island of Eternal Laughter in the Voyage of Bran. And the destinations are described in terms of their fabulous resources, their their peace, their gifts of longevity, of of healing, of uh, happiness, bliss. That is the kind of place they're going to. And something that I find very interesting and that I haven't seen done as a comparison before is that this also has echoes of another story. A very, very similar story from Irish mythology that's done from a very different perspective. The voyage of the Milesians to Ireland in the first place. The Milesians saw Ireland... Uh, they, they, when the first Milesian who landed in Ireland, Eith, arrived, he saw it as a land of incredible bounty, incredible plenty, incredible beauty. And that was at least partly part of the motivation for the other Milesians to come and to take Ireland after Eith's death. And of course, when they did voyage across the sea to come to Ireland en masse, they had to endure terrible storms. When they got here, they got sent back beyond nine waves, they had to endure the onslaught of the druids of the Tua de Danon. And then when they got through that, they had to battle the Tua de Danon themselves in order to take Ireland. It's a very strong parallel to the other other world islands, to the other voyages, to the voyages of Brendan, Maelduin and Bran. So it could be argued that Ireland itself was once seen as one of these incredible other world islands. Now all three of these stories, uh, the voyages of St. Brendan, Maelduin and Bran, all talk about myriad individual other world islands with various magical properties of their own. And there are of course other islands like that in Irish folklore and myth. They're, they're very common. There's High Brazil, of course, uh, the mythical paradise off the west coast of Ireland. There is Tirnanog, the, the land of eternal youth. There is Garrett's Island on Loch Gur, where Garrow Dirla, who is himself supposed to be half fairy, is lying asleep with many of his soldiers in a cave, waiting for the day where Ireland is at its greatest need to, to come, wake up and rescue us all, the, the King Under the Hill myth. And of course, in other branches of Celtic mythology, not just the Irish ones, we have things like the Island of Avalon, these paradise islands, these magical, incredible islands, that we could argue Ireland's Celtic ancestors may have once seen Ireland as an example of. That once before the Celts came here, they thought of Ireland as one of these magical, uh, mythical islands. But aside from other world islands, we also have these stories of sunken cities, villages and castles that are at the bottoms of lakes or at the bottom of the sea, and they are considered to be located in the other world as well. We have Ross O'Donoghue's library at the bottom of Loch Lean. Uh, we have numerous examples all over the country of lakes whose origin is supposed to have been there was once a castle there and then through some misbehavior of the ruling lord or the ruling king a druid a wise woman or a saint placed a curse on the uh, on the castle and their well overflowed and flooded and turned into a lake 
and the castle is still there with all of its occupants still there and all of them still alive. We also see this in uh, another version of that story has a servant or a maid forgetting to cover over the well and then the well overflows and creates the lake. And of course, we even have stories of people visiting these flooded underground castles, towns, cities, and returning to report back on it and reporting on their livestock and how they all keep cows, but the cows eat seaweed and, and that kind of thing. But the most fascinating and well-documented of all of these sunken towns or cities is Kilstefeen. Uh, there's lots of different ways of spelling uh, Kilstefeen, and they all would be pronounced very differently from each other. This is the one I see the most often, so it's the one I'm using, Kilstefeen. The best way I can sum up Kilstefeen is with the phrase Cottagecore Atlantis. It's supposed to be a city located in County Clare. It is sunken underneath either the Atlantic Ocean or in the, the very mouth of the River Shannon. Uh, it has dozens of different backstories of how it sank. Uh, that range from it having sunk uh, over a thousand years ago to only a few hundred years ago. It is said that Kilstefeen raises up from the sea once every seven years and that anyone who has seen it is either destined to never see it again or to die very soon after. <laughs> and it, the descriptions of the city itself vary wildly from it being filled with golden palaces to it being described as a fairly normal city for the time period in which these stories were collected. Several stories involve people discovering the location of Kilstefeen while they were out in their boat fishing on the water and instead of catching a fish they pulled up a Sunday roast because their hook had gone down the chimney of someone living in Kilstefeen. The inhabitants of Kilstefeen are said to be able to visit our world whenever they want. Uh, that includes the animals. There are even stories where a man came up from Kilstefeen to buy lumber for working on some of the buildings and had it just, th when he had bought it, he had it just thrown into a whirlpool in the middle of the sea. There's a story of a magic cow that visited the town of Lehinch during the famine. Uh, the cow came from Kilstefeen and it would come once a week. It had unlimited milk and would stop at all of the houses of the poor so that they could take some of the milk and stave off starvation. There are several stories prophesizing the permanent return of Kilstefeen uh, that usually involve either a key and the owner of that key varies wildly from various Christian saints, including St. Stephen, to Conan Whale of the Fianna, um, or a sword that needs to be drawn and carried by someone who lives on the surface. Uh, these prophecies of Kilstefeen's return also vary wildly from being very hopeful and bold and positive to being borderline apocalyptic. Now listen, this script is already 11 pages long. Uh, I don't really have time to do a deep dive on Kilstefeen. However, if you are interested in learning more about it, uh, patrons get to vote on the subjects of my future videos. However, I do think Kilstefeen is the aspect of Irish myth, uh, the aspect of Irish legend that best sums up the relationship in Irish folklore that people had with the sea and with water in general. Because it is seen as a land of great plenty, it is seen as a city where the people are thriving. Uh, the story of the cow providing for people during the famine shows it as a source of, of, of great comfort, of, 
of, well, you know, providing for people, but also the apocalyptic nature of the some of the prophecies regarding its return. The the fact that it has sunken beneath the, the sea in the first place also highlight much of the danger surrounding the sea, surrounding water. And then of course, of course, the fact that we have so many conflicting stories about Kilstefin, even the origin of the name and exactly what the name would be, because I said, there are many different names for Kilstefin, and not only would they be pronounced different ways, uh, despite being vaguely similar, they would also mean very different things. Uh, so we don't have a consistent name, really. We don't have a consistent idea of where it is. We don't have a consistent idea of when it sank. We don't have a consistent idea of who the people are, of what people are related to its return, of what will happen when it returns. That all really highlights the mystery involved as well. So I think Kilstefin is the best representation in Irish folklore of the relationship that was consistent between the Irish people and water. Hello, thanks for watching that video. Uh, if you liked it and you'd like to help out with the channel, please do like, share, leave a comment. If you'd like a deeper dive on any of the subjects or the subheadings covered in this video, uh, say so in the comments and I'll put it in one of my Patreon polls in future. And of course, if you'd like to vote in any of those polls, you can, of course, join my Patreon. You may have noticed this time I've included pictures. These pictures are actually taken from the National Folklore Archive's photographic collection, most of which was done by Kevin Danaher, but there were other photographers as well. Uh, all of that is available on Dukas.ie, or most of it anyway. I don't know why I never did this before. I've always known that existed. It just never occurred to me to use it before. Now, while I'm thanking people, I would like to especially thank the mighty Ashkarp, first of her name, Keeper of the Magikarp, and Empress of the Great Shiny Sea, Sarah, definitely not secretly the girl from Labyrinth, I swear, Queequeg, SJ Tucker, Azrai, Beth Wade, Fernando Vinegar, Vina Mac, Tyg Farrell, and Empress Janeway, as well as all of my other patrons who enable my bullshit here. And do remember that your applause is the only way to counteract my daily chant of I don't believe in fairies.